All right. Does anybody have any questions for me? Can we go over Kirchhoff's rule? Um, the easiest way to do it, I think, is by example. Um, so maybe I should make a slightly, let me make a slightly more complicated circuit than that. So let me do this. Let me say, uh, um, let me put R3 and let me do this like that. Just so that I have a junction. And so there's a, there's a, a, a circuit and usually what you have in a circuit is you have a bunch of resistors and batteries and you want to know um, you want you want to know the current through the resistors and maybe the voltages Across the resistors, if you have the if you have the current through the resistors, you can get the voltages across because the the voltage you know like V one is equal to I one R one, and so if I know the current through this resistor, then I know the voltage across it just by multiplying by the cur the current by the resistance, and so when you have a circuit like this, um, and you want to determine the currents, you have to have a different current for each leg. And so I might call this leg I1, say, because it goes through resistor one. Um, but in fact, I1 is the same from here all the way around because there's no place for the current to go between here and here as it goes around. Um, and so the, all the current that goes through this guy goes through this guy. If this is a plumbing system, every drop of water that goes through this section of pipe goes through this one and this one. It's got no choice, right? Um, when, when the current from, from this gets to this point, it can go either this way, which we'll call, say, I2, or this way, which we'll call I3. I realize they're not numbered corresponding to the resistors, but let's not worry about that, right? And so um, I2 goes all the way around to here, right? And I3 goes all the way across here. And, and, and so Kirchhoff has two rules. Right? The, the first one is called the junction rule. And in this example, it's... Um, I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. What it says is if you pick any junction, then the current going into a junction um, has to add up to all the current leaving a junction. And so at this junction, the current going in is just I1. The current leaving is I2, I2 and I3. And so, um, and so whatever's going in must add up to whatever's going out. If this is a plumbing junction, the water coming into the junction has to add up to the water going out of the junction. There's no, there's no extra pipe or hole in there leaking stuff out or anything like that, right? And so Kirchhoff's rule is, are just, the junction rule is just sort of a common sense approach to that. The second rule is the loop rule. And so I'm gonna have to just erase that one because I'm out of room, right? And so the second one is the loop rule
And it says the sum of voltage changes around a loop equals zero. And, and there are two sort of sub rules to this. Two, 2A is, uh, is Um, when going across a resistor, so so the sum of voltage changes, there's voltage change here, there's a voltage change here. Like if I just pick this loop, let me just draw a blue loop. If I just pick this loop, say, I want to pick one loop, and I'm going to start here, I get a voltage increase because I'm going from the negative end to the positive end of a battery. That'll be 2B, and I'll talk about that in a second. When I'm going from here to here, I get a change in voltage of minus IR because this is a high voltage end near the top of the battery. And this is the, the, the low volt, lower voltage and farther away. Anyway, I'm going in the direction of a current. And so as the resistor, as the current goes through the resistor, it loses voltage, it loses energy. That's what resistors do. And so I, I, I put minus IR. And so, so if I was going around this loop, I would have a positive increase across the battery, which I'll describe in, in loop 2B, in rule 2B. And then I have a minus I1, R1, minus I3, R4, minus I1, R3, right? Um, because in every one of these cases, I'm going around a resistor in the direction of the current. And so I, I would keep subtracting. I can go the other way. It doesn't matter which way I go. If I go this way, I get plus I1 R3, plus I3 R4, plus I1 R1. And now I'm going from the positive end of the battery to the negative end of the battery. So it'd be minus V1 equals zero. In both of those cases, I either add them up this way equals zero, or I add them up this way equals zero. And you can write that out and they turn out, they give you exactly the same equation. In one case, I get a plus, minus, minus, minus equals zero. And the other case, I get a plus, 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 minus equals zero. And if you just multiply both of those equations by minus one, you get the other one. I'll do, I'll do another example here in a second. So 2B, I guess I've got to come over to here. Um, 2B is, And by the way, this should say, on this one, it should say otherwise uh, plus IR. So if you're going with the current, you subtract IR. If you're going against the current, you do plus IR. I love that's helping. And so let me just give you a few examples here. So I'll just, I'm gonna erase all the text and, I, and I'll just work my way around a couple of these as we've done, right? And so let's just pick, uh, I'm just gonna label all these points, A, B, C, D, E, F. All right, so I, I labeled every junction. And I'm gonna say, let's pick, uh, let's pick loop, the whole loop, A, B, C, D, E, F. All right, and so if I start here, and I go to B, I get a plus V1. So I just get V1. And I go from here to here. Well, I'm going in the direction of the current. So I'd say minus I1, R1. Right. And I'm going from here to here. I pick the loop. I've chosen my current to go this way. And so I'm going from the positive end, of, as I'm going around the loop, I'm going from the positive end to the negative end of the battery. And so it's, it's minus V2. Yeah. And then it's, uh, Minus, did I give this a name? Uh, is this R2? I think I erased it. Um, so it's in the direction, so it's minus I2, R2. Right. Nothing happens here. And then minus I1, R3. 
equals zero. So I'm going from the um, from the negative to the positive end of the battery, I add V1. I'm going with the current. I get minus I1, R1. I'm going across the battery from the positive end to the negative end. I get, uh, I get uh, minus V2. I go from, uh, I'm, I'm going with the current here, so it's minus I2, R2. And then nothing happens here, and I go minus I3, R3. How is it when it goes against the current? Like, I don't. Okay, so so I was going to do that one. I think I think I may have written it wrong, but it with with the battery, it doesn't matter which way the current goes. It just matters which way you're going around the loop. The current only matters with the resistors. So so let me go the other way now. Okay, so I'm going to go this way to here, right? And so so uh, so let me just write loop F E D C B A, right? Or loop a f loop a f so this one was you had to go all the way back to a right and this one i started and go all the way back to a the other way around right and so i get a plus i'll just write it down here i get a plus i1 r3 right i get nothing here i get a plus i2 r2 right now i'm going backwards across the battery i'm going from the a zero a negative into the positive end so i get a plus v2 I get a plus I1, R1, and I get a minus V1 equals zero, right? My argument to you is that these two equations are exactly the same, right? All I have to do to get this equation from this equation is multiply both sides by minus one. When you multiply both sides of an equation by the same number, it doesn't change the equation. And so it doesn't matter which way I go around the loop, these two equations are identical. Right. So should the current or whenever you're going over the resistors? It's the direction of the current. When you're going over the battery, it's just the direction you're going over the battery. So, so I'd be adding V1 going this way. I'd be subtracting V1 going this way. Okay. How come we don't include the I3, R4 on there? Yeah, because we picked this loop. Oh, the outside? Yeah, and so we picked, I, I just said we're gonna pick this loop. The point is, I mean, so the way I think of these things, and this may seem a little silly, but if you've ever looked at a contour map, on like a, if you look at a, if you look at a contour map, like if, you know, in Oklahoma, we don't have contour maps because there are no hills. Right, but if you go to Colorado and you, you look at a contour map, right, or some place where they have hills, I think they have hills in Colorado, right? Um, uh, these are all, um, a contour map gives you points of, of constant elevation, right? But if, if I take a trip in Colorado and I do this, and I get back to where I started from, my total change in potential energy is zero because I may have gone way uphill and way downhill and way uphill and way downhill. But when I get back to where I started from, my total change is zero. And that's basically what Kirchhoff is saying in here. He's saying, look, you're adding energy to the energy to the electrons and you're subtracting, subtracting, subtracting. But if you get back to the same point, the total change in voltage, which is the energy per charge has to be zero. And so that's what these arguments say. And so it doesn't matter what my loop is. I can pick this loop or this loop or this loop, and so I'm gonna pick another one here in a second, and I should, they, they always add up to zero. And so what it does is it gives you equations that you can solve to determine what the currents are. So like, for example, um, so, so here's one equation, right? Um, we're not gonna solve any of this, but, um, but I'm just gonna leave this equation. Is there anybody who, who disagrees that this equation and this equation are at least mathematically the same? All right, I can multiply this one by minus one and get that one. And so it's like saying, you know, it's like saying one plus four minus five equals zero or minus one minus four plus five equals zero. Those are the same equation, right? All right, um, so 
Okay. <laughs> so if, if you assume that my V's and R's are knowns, I'm probably saying, who asked me this? Was it? Anyway. Um, um, usually what you're after is to figure out what the currents are in this thing. And so the problem is I have three unknowns, right? I have I1, I2, and I3 that I don't know. Even if I know all the V's and R's, which I usually do because I've built the circuit, um, I don't know what the I's are. And so I want to determine the I's. And so um, I, have, I have two unknowns in this equation, and so I can't solve it, even if I know all the V's and R's, because two equations, one equation and two unknowns is... is you can't solve. And so I have to get a, another equation. And so to do that, I pick another loop. And so I might pick like A, B, C, F, A, right? Right. And if I do that one, um, and I'll just write this one out, this one gives me uh, plus V1 um, minus I1, R1 minus I3, R4, because I'm going around this loop now, right? Minus I1, R3 equals zero. And hopefully we all agree that it doesn't matter. For example, I could lose, it doesn't matter where I start in the loop. I could do C, F, A, B, C, and start here and go uh, uh, minus I3, R4, minus I1, R3, um, plus V1, minus I1, R1, equals zero. That still gives me the same equation, right? I've just rearranged them. And so then finally, if I wanted to, I could say uh, loop C, D, E, F, C, right? And so that would give me minus V2 um, minus I2, R2 um, minus a uh, plus. So now I'm going to go around this way, right? Th th I've chosen this loop now. I can pick any loop and apply his loop rule, right? So let me, let me just back up here. Minus V2 minus I2, R2. Uh, plus I3 R4 equals zero, right? So I go here, I go fr from the positive side of the battery to the negative side of the battery, I subtract. So it's minus V2 minus I2 R2, nothing here. And then plus, because I'm going against the current, I3 R4. And that gives me um, another equation. So now I have three equations. This one, this one, this one, and this one and three unknowns. And so in principle, I actually have another equation because I know that I1 uh, equals I2 plus I3 from the junction rule. Um, so to get down to brass tacks, what I'm gonna ask you on a test is what I've asked you on other ones. I'm just gonna give you probably just a single loop and you're gonna get a choice of three or I guess four equations and you're gonna have to pick the one that correctly um, describes what happens going around that loop. That's probably more than you wanted to hear. Do, who asked me that question? Did that, have I answered your question? Yeah. All right. What else? Um, I have a question from uh, exam two. Okay. And it says, it has a picture, and it says, in the picture above, two objects carry charges Q1 and Q2. The electric field between the two objects is indicated by the arrows. And then it says, the electric field in the figure is blank. Oh. The picture yeah. Is it the one that looks like this? Yeah. And is this Q1? Uh, yeah, the top is Q1, the bottom is Q2. All right, and what's the question? It says the electric field in the figure is blank. And the answer is nearest 
or weakest near Q1, but I don't understand why. So who can answer that question? Is it from the line density? Yep. So, so the reason it's stronger here is because the lines are closer together. The, the electric field, like when you have a point charge, the electric field goes out, right, if it's a positive charge. And so out here, the electric field necessarily gets weaker as you get farther away, and it's more concentrated. And so that's why they use these vector arrow arrangements to do it, to, 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 to represent the electric field. You can look at the line density of the, of the arrows and say, oh, the arrows are denser here, so the, the electric field is stronger there. OK, thank you. Yeah. Can we do an example um, to find sound level difference between sounds with different intensities? So I1 equals, uh, um, so you want to, do you have two, do you have two intensities in mind? What's Not the typical really. sound level intensity? Uh, um, uh, how about how about like three times ten to the fourth uh, watts per square? No, what's a what's a really high three times ten to the minus six? There we go watts per square meter, and I two equals I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter what numbers you pick, but these are I think these are going to be hearable numbers. <laughs> I don't want to have something that would just blow up your eardrums. So I'm just trying to pick up. Uh, so eight times 10 to the minus seven um, watts per square meter, right? Um, in intensities like light intensity or sound intensity, it's, it's power per unit time. Power is energy, sorry, power per unit area. Power is the energy per time. And so like sunlight shines with a certain intensity. It's got, it's got an energy per time uh, per area, right? You're catching more energy if you, have a, if you have a bigger area and less energy if you have a smaller area, but the energy is constantly coming in. And so it's, it's a rate of energy per time, per area. Um, and so if you remember the sound level, the definition is 10 decibels times the log of uh, I over I zero, right? And where I zero, what is I zero? Just, I don't mean the numbers, but what does it represent? Does anybody remember? Well, you guys are thinking I'm gonna get my water cup. So it's the it's the lower limit of human human hearing. And so the ear the ear can hear uh, ten to the minus twelfth watts per square meter. Uh, that's that's a really tiny number. Shockingly tiny. Like, like the energy, from, the power from sunlight is about a thousand watts per square meter. Something like that. And so I know there's a sound, but it's it's that would be what would be uh, that would be a, a quadrillion times smaller. Um, that would be a really small number. Anyway, so ears are pretty sensitive. Um, and so look, so I can say uh, beta one is equal to 10 decibels times the log 
of I1 over I0. And then I could say beta 2 is equal to 10 decibels times the log of I2 over I0. Right. And if you wanted to, you can just algebraically unwind each of these things or, or, or calculate each of these things. Um, just plug in for I1, divide by this, take the log of it, take the decibels, multiply by 10 decibels and calculate beta one, right? And that would be a fine thing to do here. Um, or you can just do a little log math and say, uh, beta two minus beta one, the difference is uh, 10 decibels times the log of I two over I zero minus 10 decibels times the log of I1 over I0. Um, I, I'm, I'm constantly disturbed at how weak everyone is at logarithms. And the whole thing with the coronavirus is about logarithms and exponents, exponential growth. And I would encourage you, if you're a little weak on this, to spend a little time thinking about it. It shows up in all areas of biology and engineering. Um, and it's not very hard. Uh, but um, anyway, um, so, so I can just factor the 10 decibels out and say, look, this is the log of I2 over I0 minus the log of I1 over I0. Right. And when you subtract logs, log, I, I realize I'm doing a lot of work here, log of B minus log of A is just the log of B over A, right? And so log of this minus the log of that is just log of this divided by, log, it's just log of this divided by that, right? And so it's equal to 10 decibels, am I still on the screen? Log of I2 over I0 divided by I1 over I0, right? I'm gonna have to erase a little bit. So I'll come back up here somewhere in a race, right? Well, to, the ratio of fractions is just invert and multiply. And so beta two minus beta one is just 10 decibels times the log of I two over I zero times I zero over I one. Cancel those. And so beta two minus beta one is equal to 10 decibels times the log of um, I2 over I1 is 10 decibels times the log of 8 times 10 to the minus 7 over 3 times 10 to the minus 6. I've lost my way here. Um, eight over three. So it's 10 decibels times the log of, so this is um, <clears throat> 10 to the minus six. So this is, this cancels with that with a 10 to the minus one. And so it's 0.8 over three or eight over 30, which is uh, uh, 0 0.267. Somebody can do the math for that. Um, and so you can just you can just calculate that on your calculator. It's gonna be minus three maybe. If they ask you what either sound level was, you could of course just calculate them. Um, should we go ahead, let's go ahead and calculate that just so we know. So I get beta two minus beta one is 5.7 decibels. 
minus 5.7 decibels. If we wanted to calculate either one of them, right, we could just go ahead, we could have just gone ahead and done that. I could say beta one is equal to 10 decibels times the log of I one over I zero. That's 10 decibels times the log. You can be asked to do any one of these, right? Of that number, three times 10 to the minus six over 10 to the minus 12. These are both, the units don't matter for these things because they get canceled out every time. All right, so if I take three, I lost it here. Um, <laughs> three e minus six divided by uh, one e minus twelve equals. That takes a logarithm of that, and so this beta one is ten decibels times um, times uh, six point four eight, which is uh, sixty four point eight decibels. And so this sound has an intent, a sound of intensity three times 10 to the minus six watts per square meter has a decibel level of 64 meter, 64.8 decibels. Beta two is uh, 10 decibels times the log of uh, eight times 10 to the minus seven watts per square meter. divided by 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. When I run that through my calculator, I get uh, 10 decibels times uh, 8 e minus 7 um, divided by 1 e minus 12 equals log um, uh, 5.90. I think when I did that, minus, I got minus 4.7 or something, 7.7 seven maybe, or something like that. This is a three here, if it matters. Anyway, when you take that minus that, you should get the thing we calculated down here a few minutes ago. So that covers a few things, right? Was that the kind of question you wanted? Yeah. Okay. You could do the opposite. You know, I could say, uh, I could say, uh, um, uh, What did we just have? 59. Right. So, we, you know, we, we would just reverse that. We'd say uh, beta is equal to 10 decibels times the log of I over I zero. Right. And, and we're giving you this. That's what my beta is. Right. That's what the decibels is. So how do I get I if I know beta? Isn't it 10 to the negative beta? Yeah, basically, right? So, so I have to just algebraically invert this equation, right, to solve for i. And the first thing I have to do is just divide both sides by 10 decibels, right? And so that says that the log of i over i0 is uh, beta over 10 decibels. I'm not going to plug in yet. 
because let's just watch what the variables do, right? And then I have, I've got to get rid of this log. If I want the I here, you know, the log is acting on this thing, this whole thing. And so I have to do an inverse log. The inverse log is raising 10 to the that power. And so if I take 10 to the both sides, and so this becomes 10 to the log just cancels out. So this guy becomes I over I zero because 10 to the and log are inverse functions equals, but now I put 10 to the beta over 10 decimals. And then finally I solve for I by saying I is equal to I zero 10 to the beta over 10 decibels, right? And, and that's equal to I zero times 10 to the, well, we said uh, 59 over 10 decibels, so that's 5.9, right? And so that's equal to 10 to minus 12th watts per square meter, because that's what I zero is, times 10 to the 5.9, right? And so if I just take uh, 1 E minus 12 times uh, what I get for this is I equals uh, 7.94 times 10 to the minus seven watts per square meter. I think I had eight before, so I ran it a little funny somewhere. This probably wasn't exactly 5.9. All right, that's sound levels. What else? I have another one from. Uh, what? Uh, it says a charge Q equal to four times 10 to the negative five uh, coulombs is placed in an electric field of strength 200 uh, newtons per coulomb. Uh, how much work does the field do in moving the proton a distance of 0 0.3 meters? In the Did I say proton there? Yeah. Oh, that was my bad, right? It's not a proton if that's its charge. Um, so, so what was the strength of the electric field? Uh, 200. Uh, Newton per coulomb? Per coulomb. And so this is Q. Mm -hmm. um, and so, all right. So um, I'm, I'm missing one other piece of information. How far does it move it? Uh, 0 0.03 meters. So, um, so if you remember from, from last semester or from physics one, where we took it, um, whenever you took it, work is just force times distance. Technically, it's also times cosine theta. But in our case, the, the charge is going to move in the direction of the force. And so I can just toss that out and say that's one. Well, so, so I have a force and a distance. The force, if you remember, is, uh, is Q times the electric field. Uh, if, I, if I have a charge and I put an electric field, the force experienced by the charge is Q times the electric field. In the same way that, that the force experienced by a mass is the mass times the gravitational field, mg. The electric field is sort of the electrical equivalent of g, little g. It's the electric field. And the force it experiences is the charge times the electric field the way the gravitational force is the mass times the gravitational field. And so the work done, which is the force times the distance, is just Q times the electric field times the distance. And so that's four times 10 to the minus fifth coulombs times 200 newtons per coulomb times a 0 0.03 meters. That would make that eight times 10 to the minus three, 2.4,
times 10 to the minus five? Uh, to the minus four. Minus four. Um, so that's, uh, can I help you? you? You got a key to the, turn the elevator on? I, you know, sir, I sure don't. I got to get this big old evil tank upstairs and both the uh, elevators aren't working. They're out of all. And you know what's crazy is I think they may be out of order because I've seen people in here working on them. Oh. Uh, okay. Do you have any other way to get it up there? Well, um, uh, well um, are, are you out in a truck out there? No, I just brought it from the warehouse over there. Oh, because you look, you can see I'm big. Man. I'll be right back. Just hang on a second. Was the test just open from 8.30 to 10.30 or did he make it longer? I have no idea. I think it has to be open for four hours, but he told us to take it at 8.30 if we could. Yeah, I thought it was 8 to 12. Hmm. Because he asked yesterday if anybody couldn't take it at eight. And then he was like, just try to take it at eight. But he never said for sure. But yeah. from the email that we got, it sounded like they, they had to make it four hours. Hey, sorry about that. Um, God is trying to deliver liquid nitrogen to the chemistry department. Um, okay, so uh, did everybody get this one then? Yes. B by the way, if I can make just a little plea, all right? You guys are all science people and you know your units. You can look at this problem. You can just look at this problem and say, how do I get energy out of this? Work is energy, right? And the only way to get it is to multiply these three numbers together. Joules is Newtons times meters, and I've got to cancel out the coulombs. And so there's often a real shortcut to figuring out, you know, how to solve a problem. You can just look at the units on them and say, well, the only way to get energy out of this is to, I need Newtons times meters, so I got to multiply that by that. But then I got the coulombs here, I got to multiply the coulombs to get that to cancel. Anyway, all right. Um, so what's next? I think that's all I had. Well, if nobody's got anything else, I'll be back at 5.30. Um, I can hang around for another minute or two if you guys are kind of looking through your notes or something and want to find something. I, I, it's, when we're in the classroom, I can look and see if anybody looks like from their body language, they might have a question, but I can't do that here, so. That's all I had, so. Well, thank you for asking.
All right. I guess we'll call it. Hey, I'm Morgan, I'm going to answer your email in just a second. So you you sent me an email. Yeah, I did. And, and I was going to ask you, but I yeah. figured you were busy. Let, let me, let me uh, uh, just give me five minutes and I'll answer it, okay? Okay, take and, your time. You feel free to call me or, or if you want to talk to me or anything like that. I'm in my office, so you can either call me on my cell phone or, or just uh, call me at my office. Okay, thank so, you. You bet. Dr. Trail, I did have one question that I forgot to ask yesterday when we were talking about grades. Um, when we first took the second exam, you had said that if it hurt our grade, you wouldn't count it. Yeah. But yesterday you were saying, you know, like how to calculate it. Yeah. So if it hurt our grade, do we, do we just subtract that 100 points from the 750 to find um, out? Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to figure that out. So, yeah. um, um, what would I do for that? I, I, I will accommodate that somehow, um, but um, I've, I can't determine that until after I've after you've taken the final, right? Mm -hmm. um, probably what I'll do, I'll probably just replace it with your final if you if you uh, if it hurts your grade. How about that? Okay, I so just off the top of my head, that's what I would do. I think the vast majority of the class, once I sort of made those adjustments to it, the vast majority of you guys did pretty well on it. Um, and so for those of you who are hurt by it, I'll, I'll, I'll do something else, something reasonable like that. Okay, I was just wondering, I didn't know how to calculate or factor that in. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, I guess my answer to your question is I don't either, but you should still be able to get a pretty good idea of where you are, right? Yeah. Um, so, all right. Yeah, it'll probably it'll probably be just be just your final score, maybe your your percentage on the final. Okay, thank you. Yep. Are we done? I think so. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll see you at five thirty if you have any if you, if you want. Except Denise. Thanks for coming, Denise. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Trail. Yeah. How's your dad doing? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, this is Freya. He's, uh, it's, uh, it's a real challenge. He's, they have, he's in an assisted living facility in Michigan and they have nine people now at the facility who have coronavirus. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he's 92, so he's pretty at high risk. But the worst part of it is he's, uh, I was just talking to him right before we started this class. He is, he doesn't understand why we're not visiting him. He's got pretty serious dementia. And so he's kind of angry all the time. Right. They don't, they don't let him out of his room much because they don't want him to get sick. And so it's uh, man, it's a challenge. I've thought about just moving up there this summer and pulling him out and getting an apartment with him. But I just put, I think I just put him at bigger risk. So it's a, do you have any relatives who are in that situation? Um, I don't personally. I mean, I have older grandparents, but they're both like Are they they at home? By themselves. Yeah. But uh, my great grandmother did pass okay. uh, like right at the beginning of spring break. Oh, was it from the virus? I don't think so. Nobody told me what the cause of death was, but I think they had just discovered like the first case, like when oh. she died. so probably not. But. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's always sad. Yeah, the it's, funeral it's, was really. Oh my gosh. Like, Cause we had to all stand like six feet apart and I just felt really bad for my grandpa or my uh, grandpa. That's brutal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, people who are dying right now, the families of them, it's really hard. Cause you can't, you can't be near them when they're sick. You can't, uh, you can't be near them after they're, you can't be near your other relatives after they're dead. It's awful, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be terrible that, like, I just worry about the people who are dying alone, because, like, if you die yes. right now, you're basically dying. Yes. Yes. Every old person in, a, in an assisted living center right now is having a horrible time. It's really awful. And, and the people who, by the way, are working them, like, like where my dad is, um, twice a week, we get to FaceTime with them. So 
some nurse comes in there dressed in full, you know, PPE, mm -hmm. and they they hold a FaceTime, or they hold up, you know, an iPad in front of him, and we face to face with him a little for 15 minutes. But they're doing that, you know, there are 500 people in that center or something. I don't know what the number is. And so they're doing that with somebody every day, all day. And so they're trying, I think the, the, the staff on those places are amazing. They're trying really hard to both keep the people uninfected and not make their lives completely miserable. Yeah. It's, there's, some, there's some real challenges there. I kind of wrote, well, last year I wrote a paper about, um, we, I called it like moral injury, but it's like basically like burnout. Yeah. That, like, medical worker space because like they don't have the stuff they need to take care of their patients effectively. yeah well we're seeing a lot of that now aren't we yeah it's even worse now and they're not getting any support it's it's really it's really it's really challenging are, are you working in that now i'm not my husband is oh my gosh he um is an internet technician so he's been working the whole time but does he work in, in uh, hospital settings? He hasn't had to go in a hospital okay. since COVID that I know had. Yeah, um, internet does, technicians, uh, uh, IT people have a terrible time right now. Yeah, because he like, I mean, he does internet and like phone lines and he's like a combo technician. So he has to go in the people's homes. Yeah. And like a lot of these people that have issues are the older people who don't know how to like reset their technology and stuff yeah so yeah um yeah there's all kinds of jobs like that right now that are uh people didn't realize or don't realize how challenging they are because of the right because of the circumstances of the virus are you gonna go to medical school uh i do want to yes cool well that's gonna uh, this is gonna change the way we think about that stuff isn't it Yes, it is. <laughs> Just all of it. It's really, uh, the world's going to be a lot different, I think, after we sort of survive this. Right now, what we need is for somebody to make a vaccine for us. Oh, I know. Because people are like, people... well, we just have to get herd immunity. And I'm like, I don't think you realize how many people are going to die if we just yeah. Yeah. throw everybody out there. It's not yeah. Like... The, the worst part of it is, I was talking to my wife about this the other day, you know, the people who are really getting hit by this are the, the, the Vietnam era people. People in their sixties, you know, late sixties to seventies, and so they're just going like one more kick in the pants. Right? Yeah. As soon as they became adults, we sent them off to be killed. And now they're that was their parents doing that, and now their kids are saying, "Yeah, tough it out." It's a, uh, it's, it's awful. So that's about the age my mom's mom is. She's like in her, her I guess she just turned seventy this year, but. And she was yeah. already kind of lonely because her husband passed a couple of years ago. So I just make sure to like message her um, um, every other day, at least. Yep. Everything, Everything you can do makes a difference. All right. I'm glad that he's like that they're taking care of him up there. Uh, I did you know, know in Michigan, that's like one of the worst places to be right now. It, it is. And and he lives right near where the Capitol is. We're having all those protests. Oh, great. Right, where people are protesting. That's yeah. Great. Where all that stuff's going on. He's, he's kind of, his center is right in the middle. But he's in a really good, he, he had, he just had a really good retirement. Uh, you know, he, he they, um, anyway, it, it just, be, because of the way he saved and stuff so we he, he's in a really nice assisted living center and they're they're working really well, i get emails from them every day they they tell us you know who's sick and what's going on and um they're trying real hard to keep the inmates from being too stressed out so well, that's but you're great. right it's a terrible state right now oh yeah i'm kind of concerned about when it starts hitting the smaller towns a little bit harder yeah you mean like in oklahoma yeah um yeah uh i'm not a big fan of this reopening thing oh but, me either at all like but here we are and yeah. so um and we're throwing these people under the bus i think uh people who are immunocompromised either because of their age or for some other reason right um, and it's like 
the people who want to reopen don't want to wear masks either. And it's like, I feel like you shouldn't be able to have both. Uh, agreed. Yeah. That's what my wife's keep. That's what my wife keeps saying. She keeps saying, look, if you want to reopen, you should be advocating masks. Yeah. And it's just ridiculous. It's extremely yeah. and, and we're big on it here in Weatherford too. Like, are you feeling fine? Because this is like an adjustment, I'm sure. Well, all right. It's good talking to you. Yep, you too. Thanks for asking about my dad. Yeah. I'll, I'll see you later. You too. All right, bye.